first up is Expendables 4, or Expend Forbles, based on the way that the title is spelled. And full disclosure, I have not seen the first three films in this series, but occasionally I like dropping into a franchise like this later on, you know, once it's established itself, because you go, oh, hey, there are four of these. People must like them. There must be something to it. You know, I did that with John Wick. I started with three and then got to go back and experience, you know, the joys of John Wick. I don't know how I missed John Wick, honestly. I, you know, Equalizer, I did that recently, which was fine. Fast and the Furious, even. You know, I'd seen the first two of those in theaters when they came out, and then I didn't come back until seven and got to experience the joys of that. But anyway, The Expendables, I don't know what the hell is going on here. You know, it looks like visually something so cheap and that you could have done on iMovie or, you know, I guess After Effects on, at home. And honestly, After Effects may have been involved. But either way, it looks cheap. It feels terrible. Nobody feels like they're actually talking to each other. You know, there are so many sequences with bad green screen. You know, it'll be like, I'll go over the cast in a minute, but it'll be like Jason Statham close up driving something. And then you cut to like a wide shot and it's clearly the stunt double doing it. There are maybe like five sets in this entire movie. You know, I, again, I can't compare it to the earlier ones. I did ask a friend what was going on here. And they said that this one felt like an outlier, but it had been a while since they'd seen earlier entries into this. But okay, so we've got Jason Statham. We've got Dolph Lundgren. We've got Randy Couture, who I didn't recognize, or I guess I didn't know what Randy Couture looked like. And then we've got Sylvester Stallone. They have been in the other films, you know, big action stars. The whole premise of this franchise, especially when it started, was like, here are some of the classic you know, particularly 80s action stars plus Jason Statham, who was not in the 80s, but he's, he's you know, he's our young link, question mark, to the modern day. But here they are uniting together in these films. You know, they've had Van Damme in them. They've had Chuck Norris. They've had Schwarzenegger. They've had Bruce Willis. It's the, it's, it's uh, Jet Li. Oh my God, they had Jet Li in the first ones. You know, so it's this like super all-stars cast. And now with Expend Four Bulls, We've got this sort of shift seeming to be happening where the, I think some of the older guys don't want to come back for whatever reason, or maybe they read the script or saw the shooting schedule for this and said, we're good. Sly is clearly the, Sly and Jason Statham are, I don't know why I'm calling him Sly as if I know him, but Sylvester Stallone and Jason Statham are sort of the crux of this. The idea behind it being they're all this like sort of semi-retired or, or for hire uh, group of, not mercenaries, but, you know, military people who take on missions that, uh, yeah, that's all there is to it, you know? It's not, it's barely even there. Like, the mission in this one, again, talking to the same friend, we were, she was asking, what was the point or the plot? What were they trying to accomplish? And I was like, I think it's the following, but I'm not sure. So it's not about plot, right? Which is, again, why I figured, oh, I could just slide into this. So with the fourth one, they a lot of the old guys didn't want to come back. And I do say guys because it's a very, very testosterone-heavy franchise. This one sort of tries to address that, but doesn't do a great job. With this one, in terms of what names that the, like, the Western world definitely knows, you've got 50 Cent, Megan Fox, and Andy Garcia joining. And then this is what disappoints me. You've also got Tony Jaw and Iko Uwais, who I don't know if everyone will like know them by name in the West, but they are such good action stars. Tony Jaw especially has been working for so long. He's in Ong Bak, which is what a lot of people might know him from. He was in Furious 7. He is such a good just like physical performer his acting is fine you know it's, it's it's hard when it's not you know necessarily like your first language but he is great and these guys are just completely squandered and then you have you know another woman in the franchise you've got Levi Tran who I wasn't familiar with she's okay in it but you know the, this movie has utterly failed the women of it uh, Megan Fox is just like this one-dimensional uh, Barbie doll-esque character who of course she has to be in like midriff showing action stuff her hair is never up which drives me bonkers in any action movie I say this as someone with short hair but like if you're gonna be doing this stuff you don't want your hair in your face if you're trying to shoot someone dead anyway there is a plot I am told I, it's it's un, it's unhinged I don't even want to go into it but you know the the audience I was with I don't know they made me really question what I was missing because they would laugh at certain things I was like is this a reference to earlier parts of the franchise that I'm just not aware of is this an audience full of psychopaths I am starting to lean toward the latter, but, you know, I don't see the redeeming qualities of this film. So 
if you are like me and you're just like, oh, cool, action film, you know, I am drawn to those. This, the action in this is not exciting. Everyone, like I said, isn't really talking to each other, even though they're sometimes in the same scenes. And so you don't get that like kind of joyful, like, cool, I can't believe that these two stars are in the same movie together finally, because also you know, with this sort of uh, smattering of new folks entering, and it's no shade to the new folks. I don't think it's their fault, right? I would also sign up for a paycheck if I could. But they, you know, they have no chemistry. To get, no one has chemistry in this film. Even the people who have been in these films together for a while, this is trying to rely on Jason Statham, who I actually do think is a pretty good action star. Like, you know, I, the Meg, I'm a Meg fan. Like, it's like the guy can hold a movie, but everyone is sort of dragging him down. Ironically, one of the better actors in the film felt like it was 50 Cent. It, I'm not saying 50 Cent's a bad actor, but you have like people whose only jobs are to act in this. And you have a person whose background was not that really outshining you. This was an hour and 43 minutes of my life. I do not get back. If you are a mega fan of the franchise, I guess go and have a great time. But from what I can gather, this is the weakest of all of them. If you are not a fan of the franchise and were maybe interested in it, I would say let go watch one and two, I think, because based on the cast, those seemed the most interesting. I am considering going back, but this one really burned me. This was really bad. Again, I was just mind numbed by the production value of it. And I assume it's just like low-ish, in quotes, budget, uh, high returns internationally, but... You have these two international stars who you are also squandering. So what what a downright shame. I am going to give this a one out of five. The next film I have is called Cassandro, and it's now out on Amazon Prime. And it's inspired by a true story. And it's about a, a, a gay wrestler who is participating in Lucha Libre and sort of wants to buck the gender norms and traditions. And, you know, I guess there are I wasn't I'm not super familiar. Well, I'm not very familiar at all with, uh, uh, you know, lucha wrestling, but it, I think it's cool. You know, I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of American pro wrestling. I think I, I am so happy for everyone. I know I have friends who are super fans. Like it's basically soap opera, but with a lot more physicality and I respect the sort of stunt performances of it. So don't get me wrong there. I'm just not, you know, it's not my favorite thing, but I, I've seen a few, you know, documentaries and movies about it over the years, so I'm, I'm vaguely familiar, but I'm ev I'm less familiar with Lucha Libre. I didn't know there are characters called Exoticos out there that are kind of almost drag queens, effectively. Like, that is the closest comparison I could think of. They're more flamboyant characters, you know. Uh, unfortunately, this film is a lot about homophobia uh, and, uh, you know, the character being gay and wanting to be a wrestler, but wanting to win. And I think the Exotico, you know, sort of trope characters rarely got to win in the ring and you know it, it's not necessarily about your physical prowess it's about audience and storytelling and all this stuff because wrestling sorry it is fake I, I know I know it's a, it's a contentious but not thing but anyway Gael Garcia Bernal plays uh, Saul who is Cassandro who is the the, the Liberace of Lucha Libre I'm putting that in quotes he's good in this I think one of the things I struggled a tiny bit I mean he's a great actor I don't want to knock him is I, I understand why it was him. One, he's a very good actor. And two, it was like, oh, we need someone who's a big enough name to get other audiences to watch this film that is about a queer role. And he is not that, you know, he's and I'm like, oh, it's kind of a bummer that there isn't a gay actor out there with enough star power to sort of draw people into this. And so I understand what happened there but it is it's just slightly like a bummer to see how much progress still needs to be made while also watching the story of a character who is trying to make progress in a similar front so the irony is not lost on me I do think it's a good film I think it's a little surface level a lot of things feel more like at a text versus subtext level which is not the worst thing in the world you know I I still enjoyed it like I said I understand why you cast Gael Garcia Bernal because he's a great actor you've also got Roberta Colindres who is really good in A League of Their Own the series by the way um Raul Castillo I saw in there who I'm a big fan of oh yeah and Bad Bunny is in it and having only seen him in Bullet Train prior I thought he was very good in this you know it's not a huge role but I think he's very lovely in it Credit to him where credit is due, much like Curtis 50 Cent Jackson. I was like, yeah, you pulled your weight in this. Good on you. But anyway, 
I enjoyed the movie. It's fun. There's a lot of physicality to it. You know, I assume that they had a lot of consultants on it because the wrestling is definitely there. I just wish it had been a little deeper and got, you know, again, the elements are there. The, the stories of family and, and, you know, multiple cultures and all that stuff. But it just, it felt like if they'd just taken one more pass at it and woven it just a little bit deeper in there and not, and maybe trusted their audience more to pick up on it, I think that would have escalated it from a good film to like a spectacular film. But it's still absolutely worth a watch. Also, as I was looking up Exoticos and sort of the history of that, I found out that there is a female, uh, you know, and that Exotico has evolved over the years as in terms of like what it applies to in, in the world of wrestling. And it turns out there there's one who was a female Exotico who, who was a serial killer. And I'm like, I would like to know more about her. She had like a huge body count too. So yeah, I, I, this is it definitely piqued my interest in a very morbid way. But either way, it is a good, solid film. I will give it a 3.8 out of 5. The next thing I have this week is called The Continental from the World of John Wick. And basically, it's sort of a prequel going into the backstory of Winston's character, who's played by Ian McShane in the film series. And I was excited. You know, The Continental is the hotel that John Wick stays at a lot. It's the assassin hotel, you know, basically. And I've, I want to know more about the world of the high table and how these sort of, you know, mafioso-esque families got established and why they have this massive network of, of real estate that people can stay at. And, you know, you give your coin and there's rules and all this stuff unfortunately I I mean I gotta call it out I don't think it went as much into that as I would have hoped and also with no disrespect to Colin Woodell who plays Winston he's not Ian McShane and I think it's really tough right I'm, I'm glad most importantly that they did not try and do like a young John Wick story because Keanu is Keanu and don't even try but yeah I just didn't feel like they gave us enough about the wider world and I almost think it's a three-part limited series. I almost think it might have been served better as a movie, which is kind of a bummer. The supporting characters, I mean, the other characters in it are interesting. And I liked where a lot of that was going. There's an actress called Nung Kate in it who is so good. Also, Jessica Elaine is in this. But both the women in this are really, really good. And I was just a little frustrated that at the end of the day, it's still Winston's story. Adam Shapiro is one of the supporting guys in it. He's great. The, my other big beef with this is that Mel Gibson is in it. And I don't know when or why or whatever we decided to, and by we, I mean royal we, not me, certainly not me, decided to forgive Mel Gibson and put him in things. But I find him very, I mean, for many uh, correct reasons, very off-putting. And I don't think he deserves to be in stuff. I don't care what his acting chops may or may not be, which they're he's chewing the scenery in this. But I just, I'm not, no, it's not okay. But him aside, trying to look at the rest of it, I, I do wish we'd gone more into the story of that stuff. We get, a, we get a bit of the Winston story in the backstory. I was like, I don't know if I needed this part of it. Oh, and I'm sorry. It's not just Winston's backstory. It's also a bit of Sharon's backstory, which, I, and again, no discredit, but the, the sizes of the people they cast versus the sizes of the like later actors do not make any sense to me. Like the guy who's playing Sharon is a little bit shorter. And then the guy who's playing Winston is taller. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's a prequel. I get it. You can't, you can't, it's hard. But yeah, I like their dynamic. I like a lot of the things they're doing. I like the action of it. This is going back to something like Expendables where John Wick is something I, you know, regret not being on board with in the beginning and, and I'm a late convert to. But I do think they do a good job of trying to distinguish themselves visually in terms of action from John Wick while still keeping that spirit alive. So like that part if you like the John Wick series, I think you will appreciate. I think if you are looking to this because you were a Keanu fan, don't, this is, I don't, I can't say that this is for you. If you are obsessed with the world of John Wick and you want to know every little bit thing about it and you love the Easter eggs and you want that, that stuff is in here. It's just, it's tough as somebody who appreciates the world they've built, but also knows that so much of it relies on Keanu uh, to, to, you know, recommend this to folks who aren't, to recommend this to more to the more casual fans, but the hardcore fans, I really think you're going to enjoy this. Again, I just kind of it thought it could have been could have just tightened up a bit and been a movie, and also no Mel Gibson. But the Continental is out on Peacock. And then the very last thing I have this week is a series on Apple TV Plus called Still Up, and I just sort of happened to stumble upon this one, and you know it's it's cute. 
Uh, it's about two insomniacs, effectively, who are perpetually on the phone with each other, which seems so unhealthy. <laughs> but it's Craig Roberts and Antonia Thomas, and they're both very charming, uh, much like Expend Four Bowls. They're very rarely in the same place, but Unlike Expend Four Bowls, it actually feels like they're talking to each other. And so that carries over. And they're friends who might be like a little bit codependent sometimes, honestly. And it's about their friendship and, uh, you know, dealing with this insomnia, dealing with sort of their life issues that are going on. It's not a big series, right? It takes place in a very limited number of locations, kind of like Expend Four Bowls. Again, this is a bookend review. But I, I enjoyed it. I wish it had decided directionally what it wanted to be a little in a little more strong way you know does this want to be like an absurdist comedy does this want to be like a romance does this want to be a drama like where are we going with this but overall I thought it was sweet I enjoyed watching it I was relatively invested in their characters it's a very short and breezy watch the first three episodes are out now on Apple TV plus and then the rest are going to be available weekly